G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to the round four stock market video. Hope you've had a ripper of a week so far. I'll tell you what, uploading this has been a little bit of carnage for me. I was up to about 4 a.m. last night on take two. For some reason, there's a bit of a bug in the system. So I am very late on this. And as you can see, I've got my little man. This is little River. Uh, big lines man already, loves his footy, loves his basketball, but I'm in charge of looking after him until late this afternoon before I head off to the footy, so I need to get this done with River Round, so if you do hear any noises or laughing or gurgling in the background, it will be River, and I do apologise for that, but for this week, the notes are out the window, I'm going to have to really get through this one quickly, because it's already about 8 o'clock Thursday morning. We've got a game tonight, so we need to get this one out quickly. So the notes will go. I'm going to be pretty general with the players that are the real talking points this week. I'll certainly give you a little bit more detail on those blokes. But apart from that, we are going to get through this one pretty quickly so that you've got the time before the actual game. So hope you enjoy, guys. As we always do, we'll start off with the 500k plus defenders. Riv, let's see who's at the top list this week. At the top of the list this week, we have one of my exes in Hayden Young. This is not pretty reading for myself and many other people that traded the man out. Priced at 518700 with a three-rounder of 104, a break-even of 45, very much in the green. He'll be going up over 20K if he can hit a score of 90. So you can see the symbol in the notes here. Red to green means that he's hit some nice form He's on fire, and all of a sudden, some people, particularly the people that didn't start with him, are now looking to trade him in. Uh, two to four weeks is an eternity in Supercoach at times. Uh, the Lizard, 515,400. Very much a pod-type pick here, but has a nice three-rounder of 107. Will he be able to really mix it and match it with the big boys? I'm not too sure, but certainly a pod pick and would be a very fun player to own each week. Jeremy McGovern. Another bit of a big talking point here because 555,000 with a three-rounder of 126 is absolutely elite and right up there with the top averages in the game. So he is one that we certainly need to consider. But for me, again, it's all about that durability. You know, we look at the three to four years prior, couldn't play more than 10 games in a season. Has he got the body right? I know he went overseas with Elliot Yo to try to fix up some issues and hey, Maybe that's worked over there at Qatar. So maybe the doctors have worked a little bit of magic on McGovern's body and he's going to be fit and firing for the rest of the season. If that's the case, he should be a fantastic pickup. Getting a lot of the kickouts as well, taking over from Shannon Hearn. There was a void there. Lots of us were thinking maybe Witherden would take that up, but he's not even playing at the moment. So if you are a believer in his body, then go for it. But personally for me, I wasn't willing to pay up at a cheaper price. I'm certainly not willing to pay up now at over 550k with this man's history in regards to durability. But in saying that, if you just look at the numbers and take that not into consideration, he should be a super pick. An even better pick, in my opinion, in Harry Seasel. I've got him as a buy now, the she's, because he's under 600k, averaging 122 over the last three weeks. And if we look at his season average, it is just so super consistent. You can almost lock him in for a score around the 120s. So 88 for break even. He'll be going up over 10k this week. And he'll hit the magic 600k mark. So well done, she's. Get him in your side. Wanganeen Miller, again, super talented player. Really had a nice score last week. A pod that's on fire. 108 for a three-rounder. He isn't mixing it with the absolute best. But I think he's probably that next tier down. Still provides a little bit of value there. Jordan Clark, that three-round average would have been a lot more than 107, if not for a few comments that he made at the end of the game. Now, those comments lost him bulk super coach points. So if you're one of his few owners, you would have been absolutely spewing. But for non-owners, you may be saying to yourself, well, I was keen on him, just wanted one more week starter. He actually looked fantastic if you take those, uh, if, well, if you add those points back that he lost for that descent at the end of the game. So what's your thoughts on Jordan Clark? If you're still a fan, then maybe that's been a little bit of a blessing because you can still get him at uh, 515,000 at the moment. Oh, I've lost stone. You can see the symbol there from green to red. He's been a pod that's been on fire, but this is the trouble when you select a pod. If they have a bad match, ouch, 
doesn't it hurt, particularly in a best 22 round. So that three rounder is all the way down to 94 after that terrible stinky score last week. Hopefully bounces back for those few that did jump on, but after seeing that score, damn, I'm, I'm, I'm staying away. It was enough just to scare me off. Talk about being scared, Lockie Whitfield. Now, I did mention pre-season that Whitfield is a sort of bloke that will somehow just get random injuries, injuries that you just wouldn't expect, livers, lungs, this sort of stuff. All of a sudden, it's blurred vision. So that was absolutely on point what I said pre-season, but luckily, he bounced back to have a really nice second half. I think it was the second quarter he spent the majority of time on the bench there. I know it was definitely in the first half first half and lots of people that brought him in would have been just horrified with what they were seeing but good to see he did come back came back on and really gave us a decent score if you compare that to the time on ground so points per minute even that blurred vision was really good for Lockie Whitfield so that was good but oh these these little issues that he comes across you just you wouldn't read about it at times. Uh, Nicky Dacos got the bye this week. We don't really need to discuss him. If you want to trade him, look, you've got your own reasons for it, but I've held for this long. He's already lost cash. I'm not trading it now. I just think that would be an insane type move. Uh, Jack Sinclair, just one to put on the watch list. That break even, still in the red with that modest three-round average, but we know what his talent's like. One to definitely monitor, particularly for that late Marvel run, or when we say late later on the season. Uh, Dan Houston, just been really solid, hasn't he? Three round of 106, break even of 120, certainly achievable. He'll be just hovering around that price for a little while, I think. Luke Ryan, the numero uno, number one for defensive averages. And when we look at competition averages, he's there in the top five as well, up there with Isaac Heaney. So 644,500, there's no value to this pick. His break even is slightly in the red, but only by four. So with a projected score of 125, which I think is very fair and reasonable, he'll be basically keeping his price. So one that you don't need to jump on now, you may be able to just wait that out. James Sisley is another one, certainly do not jump on now, and possibly we may not even jump on at all. A break even of 144 with a three rounder of 102. For me, he's not even looking like one of those top primo type picks. You know, your, your Jordan Clarks are looking much better than your James Sicilies at the moment. So one that I'm simply going to monitor, and I'm hoping that if I see some good form, the numbers start to look a little bit more friendly, that I can actually trade him in, definitely under the 550 mark. So something that you might want to keep in mind as well, definitely one on the watch list, because we know what he can do. We know what he, that ceiling uh, can be like. And Tommy Stewart, this is going to be absolutely perfect because I'm going to give him a nice couple of weeks and hopefully jump on because he'll have a nice couple of games after that. I think that this could be absolutely fantastic for nine owners. So that 77 last week is certainly not what you're after when you're paying up for Tom Stewart. Super frustrating if we went with him, say, over Harry Sheasel. Ugh, ouch, that one hurts. But with Stewart, I've got the two symbols there. I've got the binoculars for the watch list and then the safest houses, because this bloke is such a safe pick. When I've just been able to do the couple of weeks prior to that, just roam around the back line, freeze a bird, freeze you like. So I'm going to wait a couple of weeks on Tommy Stewart, and then hopefully absolutely pounce on the man. Here you go, buddy. Have that, mate. Have that. Good boy. Dad, you mind you giving him chocolate? That's all. How much did he have from your Easter, buddy? That's all right. That's all right. Only the three of us need to know, mate. That's all right, okay. All right, where are we, uh, defenders? All right, on to the defenders, 250 to 500K, and at the top, we've got Marky e. Keane. Now, if you're keen on Mark, I think the ship may have sailed here. He's looking to go up 40,800 just this week with a projected score of 75, and that is, what are we, quick maths, 16 points off that three-round average. So if he gets to that three-rounder, we are looking closer to the 45 to 50k mark. Now, the issue here is that he hasn't had scoring history. I think the role's okay. Did make a few mistakes the other week, but all in all, he is a really nice pod pick. However, a super awkward price. If he's closer even to the 250 mark and very much hindsight, I know here, then I'd recommend to jump on him. But at the current price, almost 340k, I don't know how much more meat is left on the bone here long term. Short term, it's okay. But again, I think the ship has probably sailed here. Zachy Williams, lots of us own him. 
best game of the year last week with an 80 plus now were some concerns about a potential injury here i haven't heard a lot about this now one thing i did see and i watched a bit of this game was with what a few minutes to go he came on really aggressive kick inside 50 and really set up carlton's win so look with Williams, I would simply be holding him for now. I am slightly worried, but I've heard that he will be fine for this week. And with a projected score of 81, his price will rise around 34K. So I'd certainly be holding for now. If he is injured, maybe missing a week, I'd still hold if he can as well. It's best 18 anyway. Massimo Dam Brosio. As soon as I bring in this bloke, he starts to go downhill. There is some more money to make. You've got around 12K there, but you can see in the notes section, I've got the chop as well as the watch. So personally, what I'll be doing is I'll just be watching him for the next couple of weeks and looking to flip him probably when the DPP changes come. However, he's one player that will be looking to get defensive midfield eligibility. So that may be a reason for you to potentially hold on to him. I think the great thing about this is if you've got, say, a McKercher, a Roberts, a Nick Martin, you could just flip them with D'Ambrosio, get them back, bring him into your midfield, and then you could either look to upgrade or downgrade and maybe bring another decent player on your midfield bench on field, just say, if you need to. But for me, I'm holding him. Nowhere near going to be a keeper, I don't think. We may have even seen the best of him already. Hopefully not. Really hoping he bounces back in the next couple. But uh, yeah, certainly on the chopping block in a couple of weeks' time for me. Elliot Yo, he's been a wonderful selection. I must admit, a three-rounder of 107. Had the average Joe on him the other week. But now I've got the fire symbol there because after last week's performance, wow, he's been in some people's plans. Now, the issue for me, look, great price, great average. He's under 500K. I didn't start him for a reason. And that's because of durability concerns. So if I didn't start him because of that, am I really going to bring him in at this stage of the season when he's already had a price rise? Probably not for me. I think it's too risky. However, the role's great. He's getting a heap of the football, great defensive pressure. He could be, I won't say an absolute tagger, but there will be games where he may not look to get the football as much and maybe stop the opposition's best midfielder. But if you believe in his body holding up, I think he could still be a good selection. I'm just not a big believer myself. And Mitchy Hinge down the bottom, well, he's a bit of a pod pass for me. Look, a decent game on the weekend, a three-rounder of 96, but that's not enough to be a defensive keeper this year. We'll see a heap of blokes go 100-plus at a bare minimum. So Mitchy Hinge is a pass for me, but if for some reason you want a real pod, you're an Adelaide supporter, and you're a big believer in the man, go for it. But personally, not for me. On to the defenders, under 250k, and you see a pretty rare couple of symbols here in the notes section. A rule breaker along with a buy now. I never ever do this, but I'm actually going to recommend trading in a bloke that's only played the one game. Many other people are as well. You know who it is. It is Sam Closey. On the weekend in his debut game, absolutely set the world on fire. 22 touches, 7 contested, going at 77%. 8 marks with 1 contested in there as well. 2 tackles and a lovely goal just as a bit of a bonus. Unfortunately, his mum couldn't be here. She travelled over to South Africa. So, wow, what a proud mum she would have been watching over there. I think she got up at about 4 o'clock in the morning, got the cousins up as well. So, what a proud moment for the family. But to me, he looked like a seasoned player, composed no way, shape, or form out of his league. Just played a ripping game. A mature player. We know he played a couple of years for Werribee. Then got his chance at 102,400. This bloke is such a blessing. The defensive downgrade that we have been shouting out for. Now, why do I think it's a good idea to actually go early this week? Well, even if he scores a 50 next week, let's be honest. Are we not going to trade him in because of that? We'll be bringing him in regardless of what he scores, unless it's maybe like a 20-something. You go, geez, what's happened here? Doubt that will happen. I'll almost guarantee that won't happen. But I just think if you're ever going to go early, this is a bloke because you do have a few other players on the horizon. We'll talk about his teammate, Will Graham. We'll talk about him in the midfield section. We know that there's other blokes coming up as well on the horizon. You've got Charlie Combin in your forward line, who is a little bit, higher price than your traditional rookie, but he's certainly someone that may be an option. 
this is something that we really need to consider with our future planning. So that's why I'm saying personally, get this bloke in your team this week. The question is, do you fix up, uh, just say, a dead rookie like your Caulfield if you're still running with him? Or we'll talk about this bloke down the bottom. Do you make 100K and possibly trade out a Blake Cows? I'm not sure. Whatever you want to do, I recommend to bring him in because you'll need to next week. I say get it out of the way. You may even need an extra spot down back if you've got Dacos on the buy and a couple of these dead guys. So for me, Closey is an absolute lock with short-term job security. Dimmer shared him out, said how well he thought he played that wing role. I think that he also mentioned that Brandon Ellis had been a really good role model. And this is a bloke whose spot he actually took. So well done, Brandon. Great to see him hang, ha, you know, helping out the younger fellas. So for me, bring him in this week, break the rule, and absolute buy now. Tommy Brown, well, played his third game in the weekend, best of his career, 95 points for his efforts, 18 touches with over half those contested, four marks, including two contested as well, also laid five tackles, so certainly not afraid to do the dirty work, only went at 61% efficiency, so could have easily been 100 there. Frustrating miss, I think the ship's already sailed. I don't really see why you'd invest in a Brown when you've got the option to invest in close at half price or even a Graham next week. I say well done if you jumped on. He'll make you some very nice coin. But uh, look, if, if you really like what you saw and think that this can continue, then then go for it. It's okay. But I just think a half price discount closey is too good to ignore there. And I'd definitely go him over Brown if you don't own both players. Draper. Well, he's been a bit of a tra failed trade in today, hasn't he? Looked a bit out of his league last week, gave away a few frees, was far from a game to remember. Has the potential to potentially lose his spot this week. And Damo, my man from the footy mailbag, did recommend last week on the stocky to be slightly wary of him. And that seems like a good call. As an owner, you hold, but in no way, shape or form do we look to trade in. And this man, Blake Howes, a popular trade out option this week, as all of a sudden, we see his break even in the red. Whenever we see a player under 250k in the red break even zone, it's always a sign that time may be over. It's time to cut ties. So you may need an extra warm body down back this week. And even if he scores, oh, what, a 45, he'll only drop around 6k. If he scores well, he could reset that break even after the buy, begin to grow again. But it is a risk. We've seen him score 90 plus in the opening round, so he has it in him, but his three round average isn't pretty. And in current form, it's very tempting to move him on. So if you need 100K to make another upgrade this week, I think the house to Closey should be a really solid move. On to the midfielders, 500K plus, and this man up the top, Nick Martin. Bugger you, Nick. I, I, no, do you know what? This is my fault. This is my fault. I was all over him during the preseason, said he's an absolute lock, this man. I started him, and I traded him after one week. If you go back to my round review, I talk about my, I suppose, traditional way of super coach strategy, and I've gone away from that, more fantasy style, and I think it's really hurt me because this man has reminded me, while we don't trade out our premiums, I'm calling him a premium, after one round, because we need to see more. I just, I thought I'd seen enough, to be quite honest. The way he used the ball, his decision-making, I thought, no way I can continue with this pick. I just want to get out early. But after I trade him out, he's gone to 93 the week after with 31 touches. And then this is where the real pain has come into it for me as a bloke that started him and traded him out. In round three against St Kilda, 136 points. 44 touches, if you don't mind, 31 of those kicks. And then last week, 133, didn't find as much of the ball, only 35 last week for 133 points. Now, it's sickening. He's getting all the kickouts. He's getting one twos, just possessions all over the shop. Brad Scott loves the way he's defending, apparently, as well. So, unfortunately, I hate to say this, and I want to spew up, but I'm bringing him in this week. I'm bringing him back. I've got the yin yang because he started off terribly, but he is coming home like an absolute house on fire at the moment. And I don't see this stopping. I don't see the role changing. I just see lots of big scores coming up on the horizon. Best thing is, 
unlike someone like a Horn Francis, who we're really not sure about with that DPP, he's locked in. So he will be a defender at the conclusion of round six, and I cannot wait to just swing him back there. So for me, I'm willing to swallow my pride on this pick. I got it right at the start. I got it wrong trading him out, but I'm going to right my wrongs again. Felt a bit like Dr. Seuss here, but I'm going to write this. He's coming back into the side because I just don't see him going backwards. I'm not saying it's going to be 130 every week, but I don't see him getting less than the 30 disposal mark. He could tend to butcher it again, and that could come back to haunt us all. But in current form, I can't deny him. Come back in my side, Nick. I miss you, mate. Jack the Man of Steel is back. No kryptonite in sight. And I tell you what, I'm a very happy owner. I traded him in last week. I think the conditions to ground really suited him. He wasn't necessarily a fan himself, which is a little bit controversial. But for Supercoach, he is absolutely flying. 120 pluses all over the place. His best score of the year last week. Captaincy worthy with a 140 plus. I don't see this man slowing down. Spills and I last last week. Who do we get in? Steel or Took? We said absolutely get Steel in. And short term, that's been good advice so far. Shout out to you, Spills. Nice call, brother. So I'm a very, very, very happy owner. We know what he's done in the past before. And to me anyway, I think he's back there. So well done, Jack Steel. Looking great in every single way. Tackling, getting a heap of the ball. Oh, just, just absolutely love the man. Uh, Rosie, he's a pod on fire. Best score that he's done in a little while, a 150+. plus. So if you're after a pod type pick that's under 600K, Port still have a nice run of home games. He could be someone that you look to go there. And my man, Freo Tragic Dan Mashman, you're an owner, mate. Shout out to you, a very happy man the other week. Uh, Matty Crouch, now, I have heard a few people say that Crouch, uh, even some Adelaide supporters, say that Crouch does not deserve to play another game. Here's a reason for Adelaide's poor showing. I think that is absolute nonsense. Why are we blaming Matty Crouch here? We know what his deficiencies are, but I think he's one of the blokes that can actually hold his head high. Hey, if you think there needs to be a bit of a change in the midfield, that's fine, but don't rag on the man. He's been playing some good football, so... If you're an owner of Matt Crouch, I'd still be really, really happy. He's got a break even to 101, but hey, that's still under his three-round average. He's probably doing exactly what you wanted him to do and were expecting him to do, so probably hold for now, and then you may be able to possibly flip before the buy. Uh, Lockie Neal, great score. This man was on track for a 150, but did get subbed out in the last quarter. Now... There's a quick, uh, I've got it written down, where is it here, from Chris Fagan. It was a great effort by him to get up and play because his ankle is very sore. We took him off the ground in the end to protect because we've only got six days till we play Melbourne at the MCG. So this was very much precautionary. He was going into the game with a sore ankle. Nothing new here. May have aggregated it slightly, but the man wanted to actually push on just to get some more game time into him. But they made the sensible decision to rest him up just to make sure he's right this week. So if you want to go there as a bit of a pod, I could see why. But with that ankle, I'm still concerned slightly about that. I'd much rather pay 650 for him, knowing that the ankle is rested and all good again. So could be a really nice pod lock and eel. And as a Lions man myself, hope he absolutely smashes it. Oh, Libba. He heard that some people were trading him. So he thought, bugger them, I'm just going to produce one of my best career games at, what is he, 31, I'm going to say years of age. He had an amazing 19 clearances, which was third of all time, 28 contested possessions, 28, which was fourth of all time, with nine tackles, and, you know, seven uncontested touches, just for a bit of a cherry on the top. I'm not going to mention names who traded him out. They're a little bit upset this week, but if you kept the faith with Libba, congratulations, well-deserved. He went bang with one of the best games that I've ever seen him play, and the numbers would certainly back that up as well. Ah, uh, Zeret. The plan to get him cheaper before his nice fixture. That may not come to fruition. He's doing the opposite and actually rising. Talk about elite consistency. 127, 132, 131, and a 136. Phenomenal. Averaging over 32 touches a game. I was worried that Drew, Drew may shut him down last week, but no such troubles. If you don't own him already, I'd really try to find a way to bring him in, oh, say, round 7 or 8 if it's not this, this week because he's got the potential to give us some massive ceiling scores when he comes up against some of these weaker opponents. So if you're looking to go this week, I think he's an absolute buy now. You're paying up, and I hate paying up. 
but in current form, you just cannot deny him, and he's someone that really we all want to have in our sides. Uh, Matt Rowe, 620,500, one of the highest averaging midfielders this year. I'm pretty much convinced that he's got top eight written all over him, so if you want to bring him in, you can. Again, the break-even is in green, and it's in one, and it's at 126. That shows how good he's been playing over the last three oh, and over the season as a whole. So, Rao, if you like him, I think he's a fine trade-in. You can see the eight-ball symbol there. And very quickly, back to Lockie Neal. I forgot the 250 symbol there. He's playing his 250th game this week. So, congratulations, Lockie. You have just been amazing for our club, mate. And a big reason why we've seen such a, a positive turnaround. Shout out to you, you beautiful man, you double Brownlow medalist. Uh, Tuke Miller, a little bit disappointing last week. And if you did bring him in over Steel, you'd be a little bit disappointed. Now, I want to give a shout out to Casey, aka Yena Cheers, on Twitter for providing an interesting stat. In round one, he had 19 contested possessions with nine tackles. Round two, 15 contested with 10 tackles. But last week, just the eight contested and two tackles. So he believes there was a fair bit of unrewarded running there. So cheers for that, buddy. Did you get that? Yeah, nah, cheers, cheers for that, buddy. It wasn't really funny, but I'll, I'll go with it anyway. Like my own work there. But yeah, appreciate that stat, mate. Look, with Miller, there is... But he's got some elite players with him, doesn't he? So he's got your Anderson, he's got your Rao. Maybe without Flanders there, you may think that's a positive, but we did see that last week, and it wasn't actually a positive for Tuke Miller. So once keep an eye on, but I still think that he's got a good chance of finishing in the top 10 for averages this year. Uh, my man Josh Dunkley, 607,200. A decent game last week, but he's really not doing enough to put his hand up for a spot in my side. But I've definitely got the binoculars there because we know what this man's like. We know when he's on, he is on massive ceiling. And for some of us, if he didn't have that round zero game or that early buy, he may have been their starting size. He would have been someone I would have been considering, actually, after a bit of, you could say, value there, after playing with injury or through injury last year. So not for me at the moment, but yeah, a, a wonderful player is Josh Dunkley. And the Green Machine, bit of a down game last week compared to what he's produced so far. If you had him as the big captain over in Isaac Heaney, or if you didn't have Heaney in your loop, You'd be quite upset there, but remember, he is still the third highest averaging player in the game. So I've still got him as a must-have, but again, something to keep in mind is that he's had a really nice run early. That's why I started him and was originally looking to flip. Not doing that anymore, obviously, but yeah, maybe don't expect 150s each week, but I'm certainly looking for regular 125, 130 plus scores here, and I still think he's got the chance to end the season as our M1. Rory Laird, 634,800, getting older. We see the desk in the note symbol there. He's a desk, so reliable. If you want to get him in, you can, but I'm probably looking next gen at the moment. Karushan Petrucka, 660,200. I've got the Uber in the note section there. You can bring this man in, I think, whenever you want. Even that break even of 140, Always achievable from him. He should be staying around his price for the short term anyway. Errol is one that I would really look at potentially after his buy. I wouldn't look to flip the man. He'll give you some good scores. He'll give you some average type scores. But the best thing about him when he's on, he is really on. He can deliver you a 180 quite easily when the time is right. So he's one that I may be looking at as a bit of an upgrade after his buy. A Dawson I'll get to in a little bit. Might talk about him uh, with another player out of you together. Uh, the Schlong, quite outing. Well, this is quite a outing of the year so far. Only netting a 94 after a blistering start to the year. Second behind Tom Green for average points in the midfield. So one I wouldn't really be worrying about after that dodgy type score. Clary, I'm very worried about. I don't think there's too many owners out there. But a three-round average of 79. Unheard of. Unheard of for Clayton Oliver. So with that break-even of 156... He's one that should be absolutely right for the picking after the buy after he's had that rest. Get that hand right, finger right, thumb, whatever it is. Oh, man. I, I can't believe what we're seeing here. But he's definitely one to keep on your watch list. I'm worried about it because I don't think it's absolutely given that we even bring him in at under 500k. If, however, we do see that form turn around and we start to see a little bit of the clarity of old, he will be the bargain of a century. Uh, Zaki Butters... I haven't seen a real ceiling game. The 119 last week, an awkward VC type score to take, but he's another one that you really want in your side. 
I wouldn't be paying up for him right now. That break even is getting pretty high. But whenever his price does come down, maybe to hopefully say the 620 mark, then that may be a nice time to jump on the man. Uh, Darcy Parrish, geez, 604,200. A few of us are even contemplating starting this bloke before that injury in the preseason. With a break even of 193, could he be a man? The LD version of Zach Merritt for that Essendon draw. Certainly something I'm willing to consider because we've seen what damage that Darcy Parrish can do. But for now, a big watch. Let's just see what happens there. And as I mentioned, I might quickly discuss LD and Dawson together because I've had a few questions, <clears throat> excuse me, about whether or not you should hold. It's a tough call. It's a very tough call. You probably should have traded out already, but if you hold, there's a few things to consider. If you trade them now, you're locking in a pretty big cash loss and you're also allowing others to swoop on them as fallen premiums when they hit form again. And I guarantee you, they'll hit a good streak. The question is when. If you look at Dawson's fantasy numbers and stats in isolation, everything seems pretty good. We all know what it is, and I'm still shocked to say it, but it's his use of the football. As soon as his big leg gets back to what we've been accustomed to, or what he has, I expect his average to really rise. And I'm looking at bringing him in in about two weeks before I think he has a fairly decent run. In saying that, this is a bloke who we paid over 600 k for that is yet to hit triple figures in Supercoach. So if you've had enough, I don't blame you. Uh, he did spend a little bit of time forward last week in the fourth when Berry came on as a sub. So that's also something to keep an eye on. But uh, look, I'd be tempted to hold and try to ride this disposal efficiency conundrum out. But again, it's completely up to you. Now, with LDU, the numbers and projections based off age, you know, potential, post by average from 2023 suggested he would be an absolute breakout Uber selection. His first two games were okay, particularly his first, then had a poor next game where he received some attention, and then he was also poor last week. Something does seem a little off. It's no longer his midfield. He hasn't got it to himself anymore, so... Tough decisions to be made as owners. For non-owners, put him on your put him on your watch list because we know what he can produce. But at the moment, with a three-round average of 87, a break-even of 167, even if he goes a reasonable enough 112, he's losing another 25k. Do you just jump onto a Jack Steele now? It's a possibility, but all the best of luck with a very tough decision. On to the midfielders, 250 to 500K, and we do have a couple of blokes in particular to talk about here. The first man up the top, Jeremy Sharp, a huge miss if you didn't start this man. And we even have some people considering trading him in this week. We see that negative break even of 51, but we look at the price and it's 255,600. A one full three rounder of 83, and a lovely 125 last week. Now, with a projected score of 68, which is definitely achievable from Sharp, he'll rise around 55,000 just this week. But you do see there in the notes section that I do have the ship sailing. I think it may have already sailed, but I also have the buy now symbol there for those people that are really interested in him. I won't be doing it myself, but I can see the attraction to the pick. So you could have him on field. He's been giving us some decent scores. Probably good enough to have on there, even if we take that 125 away. But last week, 29 touches, 17 kicks, 12 handballs at 90% efficiency, if you don't mind. Only five of those were contested, but we know that's his style of game on the wing there. But I don't know if it was just me because I didn't catch the whole game here. But when I was viewing it, was it maybe in the third quarter, fourth, maybe, I'm not too sure. I reckon for about a 15-minute patch of that game, no word of a lie, the ball just lived on that wing. He was on the end of everything. I just don't see that happening too often. It was a bit of a lucky game. I'm not saying lucky from Sharp. He played an absolute ripper, but lucky that the ball was there so often. The other winger, whoever that was, the poor bloke, I don't reckon he would have got much of it because Sharp was absolutely cleaning up there, linking up really well. One, twos, kicked that ripping goal just to add that cherry on the top to his game. So, look, I'm not a fan of bringing him in at this price. As I said, I think the ship sailed. He's got good coin to make. 
in the short term, but we know what can happen with these rookies. We've even seen it like a Blake House, you know, start off that really nice score with that 90 plus, and then we saw a, a 20 odd. I don't think Sharp's the type of bloke with his role to go a 20 odd, but even just say a, a couple of 50s or a, a score around there in a row, then you'll make some good coin, but then he'll most likely even start to lose some of that coin that he has made. So you could look him as a bit of a quick flip, but for me, I'm keener on bringing in blokes that are at rookie price, say that 117 to even 140 type mark, over a sharp where you're paying 255 already. I just think that the ship has probably sailed there. If you want to go for it though, go for it. There's a chance that it could work out in the short term. Uh, Jared Lyons, this is so frustrating. A negative break even of 40. As you can see in the notes section there, cash to be made, but there is the omission symbol. He's not even getting in the 23 as a sub at the moment. So we'll most likely have to rely on injuries. And when Brisbane are winning, Fagan is loath to make many changes. So a winning Brisbane team with Jared Lyons out of it is not good reading for him. But if he comes back in, an 80 is absolutely on the cards. He makes 55K. How long can you hold him there for? I just don't know. That's up to you. But I really don't see him coming in anytime soon unless we fall off a cliff again and he bangs down the door in the resis. This is a bike we need to talk about. The Horn. Jason Horn Francis, the talk of the Super Coach Town this week. After a fantastic game on the weekend, that's been two pretty decent ones. One of the most traded in players this round, given his potential value, low break even. If he scores a 90, he makes 40k just this week. All right, what's the worst that could happen? Well, you could get stuck with a mid price midfielder averaging 85 to 90 and getting yourself another, say, Ollie Wines. Best case scenario. For me, that would be to obtain DPP status after round six and become a forward premium that's averaging between, say, 105 to 110. Even in the midfield at 110, I think it's okay. I've heard he needs to play around 40 to 45% forward time to get DPP. In my view, I don't think that's a high chance. And personally, if that's what you're banking on, bringing him into your side to be that DPP forward, no, I don't think that that's going to be super realistic. That's just the way that I see it anyway. He's the highest averaging CBA mid for Port with 69%, which is actually pretty low for a number one mid. Unlike, say, uh, the Dogs or traditionally maybe the Suns, they don't have a tight midfield rotation. But at Port, everyone's welcome. You've got Wines, Drew, Rosie, but as they've all got 54% plus. You can also throw in Jackson Mead with a sprinkle of 26%. Does the Horn see CBAs decrease when Wines comes back? Well, in the one game they played together, the Horn had a higher CBA rate than what he actually did last week without Wines in the side. Question for me is, can all of Rosie, Butters, I'll throw Drew in there, and Horn Francis all average 100 plus? You know, Rosie and Butters are absolute shoo-ins, but the other guys, I'm just not too sure. Short term, it's a nice cash grab. We all know that someday this bloke will become an Uber premium. But are we going a little bit too early to expect that from him this year? I probably think so. In saying that, we don't actually need him to get to the Uber Elite status this year for the pick to work. All in all, I'm not going there as a mid only, and I think that's how he'll stay, a mid only. I'm going to focus on not mucking around on that particular line. You know, forwards maybe. But in the midfield, I'm just going to focus on bringing the big dogs. But that could come back to burn me. And the horn may be in my nightmares if he continues to average a 122. So I could see why you'd want to go there. I could also see why you'd be a little bit more cautious on the pick. Uh, Rolly Sanders, we'll shoot through these ones a little bit quicker. We've all got him, 292,900. Absolute hold, break even of eight. And potential to get DPP status as a mid forward. I think he's ap actually on track now, but there's no guarantee. So keep a big watch on that mid time and forward time for him. Uh, Bonner, hasn't he turned around his season? Well, 351,600 now with a break even of nine. I thought he may have even been dropped last week after record turn turnovers, but he managed to improve that efficiency. Has a three rounder of 86. Projected score of 86, and that will see him rise 35.5k, an absolute hold in my books, as is Matty Roberts, 335,900, break even of 14. People see the buy symbol and that blue dot and think, yeah, let's just get rid of him. Do not do this. He's a future DPP holder, swinging back, 
get him on field. I'm planning to keep this bloke for a fair while until he maybe throws out a couple of 50s in a row maybe and that cash is looking to go down rapidly. I'll be trading him out then, but until that point, I see him as a massive hold. And the Kircher, I see him as a hold as well. Look, some people are actually trading out in order to make an upgrade. I think that is okay if you are getting a really nice upgrade into your side. I may not go for, say, McKercher to a Horn Francis. I think that may be a little bit too speculative. But if you're going for a big dog, getting a guaranteed type player in like a Zeret, then I would absolutely go there. However... I see him as more of a hold, as you can see on the notes section there. I'll be doing that myself. Future DPP, he can be a really nice swing for us. Did have a bit of a different role last week, though, into the mid, even playing a little bit of forward time. So that is a slight red flag. I'd love to see him get back to that half-back role. And Georgie Hewitt, 481,900 with a three-rounder of 100-plus, break-even of 48. He's worked out okay, actually. Looked really good in the last couple of weeks. I think the week before that, we thought, oh, maybe some warning signs here. But all good with him. He's looking to rise another 20-plus K this week. So for me, he is a hold. One thing to keep in mind, though, just before I finish, is that Sam Walsh is coming back. Is it this week? Is it next week? I'm not too sure. Keep an eye on the team sheets. Does this affect Hewitt? I don't think too much. A slight possibility. Uh, you don't look to invest in any way, but as, as an owner, definitely hold on to the man. On to the midfielders, under 250k. Another rule breaker up the top. Closest teammate in Will Graham. Really talented young player with defensive mid status, which is super handy. You can get him in your midfield or get him in your defensive line as well. Now, I'm not recommending to go early on Graham this week. He is certainly one that I would wait for. You go closey, but you don't go Graham this week. But certainly one to keep a really close watch on. He seemed to take over that Flanders role along with Bailey Humphrey. Now, remember, Humphrey was subbed out of this game. So I think that Will Graham could be a potential sub-risk going into the future as well, but had a really nice role. CBAs, a lot to like about Mr. Graham. 17 touches, seven of those contested, went at 82% efficiency, which is really nice. Had three turnovers. That's okay. The one intercept possession. So all in all... I really liked what this man did. They're going to look to go next generation, and he is certainly going to be, hopefully for the Suns, a big part of their next generation as well. Had the five clearances, two of those were center clearances, three stoppages as well. So all in all, I think this was a really nice game. Had three tackles. I think he's not too afraid to get the dirty work done. So wait a week on him but definitely have him in your plans for the week after because he can fix one of those dead rookies if you don't do that this week with your Klaus. If you look to uh, downgrade a house type pick, he is going to be a bit of a godsend for us come the end of this week. So keep him on your watch list, but I wouldn't advise going him just yet. Jacob Ware, he's been a really good rookie that's gone under the radar a little bit here. A negative break even of 20. So if he scores around a 50, 30 plus K this week, an absolute hold that don't invest. Jack Carroll, you can see my man, John O'Carroll there. You've got your symbol this week, great man. You deserve it because you've been one of my longest serving members of the channel. Your cousin, your cousin, geez, cousin even, your cousin Jack has been lighting it up in the AFL, Jono. So please wish him all the best, mate. Needs to get him onto a podcast one day. You don't look to invest here. There may be a little bit of a red flag with Sam Walsh coming back, but I believe that Elijah Hollands was injured. So that may give Carroll a little bit more job security there. But certainly keep a watch on what his role's looking like when Sam Walsh does come back into the side. Clark's been super frustrating. You can see that I've got the slow burn symbol as well as a sub. He was on more points he'd actually finished on halfway through the second quarter, if you'd believe that or not, but gave a couple of free kicks away, went missing, then subbed. Oh, I've got Clark. I haven't got Sharp. It's an absolute disaster. But look, even if he scores a 36, he's still looking to go up over 10K. So I'll take anything I can get at the moment. But uh, yeah, certainly would possibly look to trade him out with another sort of dodgy score next week. And Sam Berry for me is an absolute sell, particularly if he's a sub. If he's not named the sub, then you could go there. It's achievable to score 54, maybe in three quarters for him. I say three quarters because if he doesn't start as a sub, I think there's a very, very high chance of him actually being subbed out of the game. So 
I'm a current owner. He's a sell for me. And if he hits that projected score of 46, could happen depending on what happens with his availability. Hey, he may not even be selected this week, but if he does go off 46, you're actually losing cash, three and a half grand. It's not a heap, so you could keep him there. But for me, he's gone ski this week. The berry has been a little bit sour. On to the big boys in the rucks. And at the top of the list, we have Lloyd Meek, a huge talking point this week. And I can see this going either really good or really bad. 357,000 with scores of 88 and 130. A negative break even of 14. Currently the number one ruck ahead of Reeves. And geez, didn't he look good last week? The issue is, will they be tempted to play Reeves and Meek together? Or does Meek get dropped if he puts in a quiet game or two? That's a big risk. Unlike other players or other clubs, he's not the clear number one standout. There is competition. If you play solo ruck for, say, three to five weeks, then I think the pick works. But keep in mind, you will need to upgrade him again. I don't think he's going to be anywhere close to a season-long keeper. The 130 looks great, but remember the week before, only an 88. And we won't really see Gorn do that too often, just as an example of one player that's the absolute number one standout at their club. If he averages 100 flat... Now, my man Scobie... My little baby goose, he, he's done the maths for us here, so make sure to follow him on X at scoby underscore SC hub. He's done the maths, and if he averages 100 flat for the next two, he'll be at 452,700 with a break even of 59 heading into round seven. That's when the DPP changes will come into effect. Won't affect him, but just something to mention. That would almost be a win. Next two opponents are Wits and Sherry. So not easy matchups, but if you think you can still score well, then you can go for it. A big risk, but I can see this one paying off. If you trade out Grundy, you're making around 150k there. That will then allow you to then upgrade somewhere else, but Meek will be an upgrade in himself. Maybe you're thinking, is well, I'm not going to stuff around with any mid prices. I'm just going, going to go with one of the big boys. If that's what you want to do, then I think that is absolutely fine. I'll probably be doing that myself. But I may be sitting here in a couple of weeks going, dang, why didn't I get Meek in? Uh, Tristan Sherry, I must admit, this really annoyed me last week because obviously I don't own Sherry and I'm a Brisbane Lions supporter. So that trip on Lockie Neal, and it was 100% a trip uh, in North forward line. I'll tell you what, he should have lost points for that. Instead, he gets a free kick for, obviously that tackle counted, goes back, slots the goal. It was their second of the game, so big points, big bonus points there for Sherry. Well done if you brought him in a couple of weeks back because he's looking good. North looking to sign him up long term, so I don't think you look to invest at the moment. I think the ship sailed there, you can see the symbol, but at the same time, I think he's going to be a solid selection and looking a little bit better than my man Brody Grundy at the moment. He may not be my man after this week, though. Uh, Maxi Gorn, the clear number one ruck this year. Look at that three-round average, 140. And I'll put a wow symbol next to the projected score. They're projecting him to go just a lazy 169 this week, which would then allow him to rise above the 700k mark. Now, I'm not saying he's going to go anywhere near 169. Hey, as an owner, I hope so. That's just their projections. But hey, even if he just gives us a nice 130 type score, again, he's going to give us some really nice coin. What a selection he's been. And it's awkward because he's got the buy coming up, but I view him as an absolute must-have. I think you can even get him in this week. But frustrating knowing that you're going to have him in for one and then he misses the next. Brody Grundy, I think it's time for him to go. Bye-bye on the buy now. Other people may say that you've got other concerns in your team, and if that's team dependent, absolutely keep on to him. This is just general advice here. I think this is the ideal time to move him. Even though he's got that break even of 83, and Spills and I talked about this on the Swordplay potty, what I was really disappointed about is the fact that he had the opportunity last week against West Coast to say to me, keep me in DR, give me another opportunity. I can really mix it with the big boys this year. Just give us another chance. You've seen a nice couple of weeks. I did well against Snank when we played the Tigers. So just keep me in. I'm going to give you a nice 130. And it just wasn't anything like that. Couldn't even reach triple figures. 
against a lowly West Coast Ruck division. So that pretty much stamped his papers for me. He's going to be missing this week. So another play could be to bring Dogger in to your Rucks if you've got that DPP there and then trade Brody Grundy to a forward or a midfield or a back, depending on what DPP that you personally have in your side. But he just isn't showing enough for me. And Spill said it really good as well. He's like the Ollie Wines of the Ruck division. When we talk talk about Ollie, it's just he's going okay, he's delivering okay he's type scores. You look at three rounder, it's 102, but the gap between Grundy and the real big boys of the comp, it's just too far. I think this is the perfect time to move him on personally, but if you don't want to, again, that is okay. Now, the next two blokes, because I'm assuming that most teams around that I've seen have Max Gorn. If you don't have Maxi, he's clearly the man that you need to bring in. But if you are a Gorn and let's just say Grundy owner, if you've got that combo, then you're going to be bringing in one of these two blokes. Rowan Marshall or Tim English. Now, quickly to English, there was a tweet put out by Fancy Frico, and the tweet was, in ruck contest per game on average for English, in 2023, it was 79, and now in 2024, it's down to 68. So he is down 11 contests, which obviously gives him less of a chance to get a, an effective hit out to advantage. There's little bits and pieces here, even that ruck time, that, that split. He's losing a bit there. Darcy's coming in at times. So there are some slight concerns on potentially that ceiling for Tim English, but I still think that he's clearly going to be, well, obviously in the top three rucks. I'm still banking him over Marshall this year. The difference is Marshall is clearly, clearly the number one. Now, English is a number one, but he doesn't have a lot of competition. Someone did did comment, and I forget who it was. Um, apologies, because I can't share it yet. I don't know if this is confirmed whatsoever. Someone just commented on one of the videos that Ross Lyons even mentioned the potential to bring Phillips into the side, was it? To maybe give him a bit of a chop out? I'm not too sure. I'm not saying that's true at all, but I have heard or read the comments somewhere so just keep that in mind as well but i still think that rowan's going to be a super selection you are saving around 85k here rowan's got the lower break even english is still at 154 what you could do is do what i'm likely to do this week use dpp to bring grundy out and then invest elsewhere and just wait to get a couple more weeks data on these two blokes but if you're really keen on bringing one in this week the option really is yours. I say they're both buy nows because they're clearly the blokes that you want to have in if you don't have Gorn. It's just what your preference is. What can you do with that extra 85 odd K? You may be able to work wonders with that. And that could be the difference to actually give you an extra upgrade. Let's just say if you're boosting. So if that's the case, I'd probably just go with, with Rowan. What's the difference in average going to be? Well, if you look at the three round, it's 15. Is that how it's going to stay for the season? Potentially, maybe the 10 mark. Hey, you could have Rowan over him. I'm not too sure, but they're clearly the two that you want to get in. Which one do you get in? It's personal preference. For me, it's all about what you think the difference in average is going to be. It needs to come down to your personal predictions and what you can do with the extra cash. So either way, good selections. In saying that again, you could wait at the same time. On to the forwards, 500k plus, and Sir Isaac Heaney boasts the highest average in the game. Look at that price, 638,400, with a three-round average of 147. Congrats if you got him as your captain last week. Weren't we rejoicing there? A break-even of 52. How's that? So far into the green, it's not funny, and he's priced at 638,000. This bloke's looking to get to 700 easily in the current form that he's in. Projected score... Not applicable this week, all the rise. So for non-owners, here's finally some relief. The first time this year that you've had some relief. He's got the buy, but I'll tell you what, if you don't own him, it's been an absolute killer. Well done, Sir Isaac. I've knighted this bloke this year. Now, Dogger Jackson, an interesting discussion this week because we see his break even. I've made a mistake there. I've got it in the green. This is so far into the red, it's not funny. I don't know what I've done with the order here. It is all over the shop. I've just realized that. But uh, look, with Luke Jackson, this is your issue. It's likely that Shrek's going to be back this week or possibly the next. We'll need to wait for team sheets. I heard that Shrek just needs to get through Wednesday's training session to get the all clear. They're playing Port this week, and then they've got West Coast the week after. Now, What's the split going to be like if Shrek comes back? I still think that it could be close to 50-50, but the issue is here, 
he's most likely, and we're talking about Doggy here, at his highest price point. You may even look to move him on this week if you're not confident that he can maintain a decent average when Shrek comes back. This may have always been your play to start him and then flip him around this time. But remember, if you own Grundy, if you're going to hold him, if you're a Gorn owner, which many of us are, if you can swap him into your ruck line, if you've got a Livingston, for example, that DPP, he could be really handy. So it's an awkward couple of weeks coming up for Dogger. Even with West Coast, there's no guarantee he gets a massive score there. McGovern's in really good form, but I think Key Fords have been averaging around four shots a goal per game on him. And then he'll most likely come up against their second string Ruckman. So there could be some big points on offer there, but something that we don't absolutely guarantee ourselves. So it's up to you what you want to do with him. A pod move could be to move him on this week if you're not confident. But personally, I'm going to hold for at least the next couple. And he could be a pretty decent stepping stone to an English or Rowan type or Gorn, whichever one of the big three that you don't own. Sam Flanders, well, we can see the buy now symbol there, the roll reversal symbol, which is probably the big talking point. And then we've obviously got Nettie Flanders as well. So what happened here? No CBAs. Normally, if we hear that, we are panicking. Uh-oh, Flanders with no CBAs. He's pretty much a dead pick now, but he found himself pretty much doing what Sexton should have been doing and playing off the half back line. Got a heap of the peel, looked really nice. Dimmer said that he had a bit of composure back down, which they really liked, delivered the ball effectively and got a heap of it, as I mentioned. So I actually think this role will continue. We had other blokes like Graham and Humphrey that have been rolling through that midfield, possibly taking over that role from Flanders. So the good thing with this is, Whichever role he plays, whether or not that's off half back, where it can be that seagull, that distributor, or if he's getting those CBAs, the two roles are absolutely fantastic for Supercoach. I think this is going to be okay. It may even put some people off. Some people are even looking at this as more of a positive, but I'm still in the middle with that. All I'll say is I think he should be in your team and should be an absolute lock to be a top forward this year. Dane Zorko, well, the three rounder is in triple figures. The break even's low. But I've got the Mr. Burns symbol there. This bloke is an old man, and I'm worried that he could go down at any time. He's had some injury worries, particularly for the last three years, and they're issues that he's just had to continue to manage. They're not going to just go away. So that will always concern me. Although he's in great form, I'm going to pass on Zorko for now. Mr. Bolton, a very low break even, the lowest on this list with a 43. You can see the roller coaster there is actually going up at this stage because he's had... A couple of really, really good weeks, playing more time in the midfield as well. And if we see Bolton as a 60-plus percent CBA mid, absolutely, I'll probably look to get him in the side. But he's a roller coaster type pick. I'll never pay over 500 for him. You'll be able to get him hopefully around the 450 mark if you really want to go there after a couple of those floor games. So always dangerous getting Bolton when he's at this 500k plus price point, in my opinion. And the man down the bottom, Charlie Kerno, could he win another Coleman this year? Very, very possible. I think Hogan's in front at the moment. But for me, he's a pass, just given the fact that you've got your Heenies, your Flanders, and hopefully some other blokes that may even potentially get some DPP there. I'm not paying 535k for a key forward, although we will see some ceiling games. I just don't see him as being a real necessity when we've got plenty of other value that we can look to get in our sides around this mark, or even better, below this mark. On to the forwards, 250 to 500k. I'm going to get through these guys pretty quick because I really don't think there are any trade-in options this week. You've got Dempsey at 265,400. Some people are viewing him still as a trade-in, but for me, the ship has sailed. What I do have there, though, is the future DPP symbol because he is on track to also obtain midfield status. So for current owners, he's been such a wonderful, wonderful investment and could be the difference between, let's just say, a top 3K ranking, a top 20K ranking by having him currently on field in your forward line ahead of, let's just say, a Darcy Wilson type. A Harley Reid, 274,100. A big comeback game last week. We saw the best of him finally. A break even of 12, looking to go up 25K with a projected score of 67. An absolute hold in my books. An interesting one with Nat Fife. Now, people have asked me, should I be trading him in? I say absolutely not. Now, you look at current form and you say, hey, he could be a really nice player to slot into that forward line, maybe a F4, F5 position, and be a potential keeper. 
my view on Fife is if you didn't start him, you can't trade him in. We've been burnt so many times in the past with this pick, and although things are looking good at the moment, I see rests coming up in the future. I can't see his body lasting a full season. I hope it does as an owner, don't get me wrong, but we do need to be realistic here. So trading him in when he's already rised, look, he does have 23K to make with a projected score of 77. So as an owner, 100% hold, we know this, but as a buyer, someone looking to trade him in, I just couldn't go there myself. Now, round one had a 100-plus score. Round, well, the last round, 100-plus score. But keep in mind, a couple of 69s in between. So with 100 last week, you know, it could be some short-term love here. But remember, you do have a couple of 69s in there as well. Hey, you may not mind a 69, who knows? And uh, that may give you some short-term enjoyment. Keep it clean to you. This is why I shouldn't go off the top of my head here. But uh, look, I better stop that there. Nat Five, I don't think is a trade-in but certainly not a trade out. Maxi King, geez, he had a rough start to the game and owners may have been expecting a lot more given the ground dimensions, given what some like a Joey Danaher did. He scored, I think it was a 140, 150 type score from last week, but slightly disappointing there. We knew this was going to be most likely a short-term sugar hit. So he's already made some decent coin last week, looking to make some more this week around the 30K mark, if you can go 100 plus. Will that happen? I'm not too sure. The ship has absolutely absolutely sailed here for me. Tom Powell, three symbols there. Big J, he was on him before the start of the preseason. Uh, we've got the robbery symbol there and the DPP with the plus. So he will be someone that is guaranteed, absolutely 100% locked in to get midfield status. Really, really handy there. But he was absolutely robbed. I'm not going to have a rant now because I want to get through this quick, but go back to the sword play potty. Go back to my round review. You know exactly why I have the robbery sign there. Come on, champion data. Do better, people. Jack Billings, I'm not going to say anything here except for break even 76. Very much in the red by 21. I have the spud symbol there. This bloke is an absolute potato. I got trapped by Jack. Uh, James Jordan, absolute sell this week for me. He's on the buy. The break even's in red with a 78. I don't know if Adams is really going to affect him, but he actually had a few more CBAs last week with Heaney dropping close to the 50 mark. So for me, absolute trade out. I don't see any reason to hold on to him at the moment. Zachy Fisher, if you've still got him, well, the break even slightly in the red there, but for me, very much a failed pick. DPP status though, that could come in handy. He will be guaranteed a defensive forward option at the conclusion of round six. So that may sway you to keep him if you've got a Buku type pick or another player that will have that same status. But for me, a pretty easy trade out, but one that you're maybe not desperate to get out at the moment. Has a little bit more time in your side. And last bloke on the week uh, on the list here is, well, someone that is an ex of mine. I had a terrible short-term relationship. What could have even been last week for him, had a massive first quarter, but then really didn't do much after that. Very quiet second half. But if things had have just stuck, that boy had have stuck, and things may have just gone 5% right with Jesse Hogan, then this could have actually been a pretty decent score. But break him in the red with a 128, with a 93, looking to lose 16K. I think it may be time to move him on. However, in saying that, with Heaney out, if you keep Montel Jordan for some reason, depending on who you're running with in your forward line, you may need to keep him just for this week. But I'm not a huge fan of Hogan's output in the short term here. I think if you can, say bye to him now. And we'll finish off with the forwards under 250k. And we have a rule breaker up the top. It's Mr. Charlie Combin. Now, keep in mind, when I've got the rule breaker symbol, I'm not saying... To bring them in this week, you have to bring them in this week. The rule that's broken is simply the fact that in order to get a player's name on any slide here, they need to usually play a minimum of two games. So you can see there in the projected rise, not applicable because he will not be going up this week. You can certainly wait a week on Charlie Combin, but as I mentioned, a career game last week, 25 touches, nine of those contested, 14 kicks and 11 handballs. The best thing here is out of those eight marks were the fact that three of those were contested as well. A heap of intercept possessions, 13 in total. There is so much to like about this pick. And what an upgrade that we had here on Toby Pink. Unfortunate if you went there because I don't know if Pinky's going to get in the side without any injuries. So back to Charlie Combin though, 129 points. My battery's running low there. Isn't this absolutely wonderful? I'll have to edit this out in a sec, but 
With with Combin, I would be waiting the week. However, if you're really forced to go down and you've already got a closey, for example, for the limited teams that do, I think that it could potentially be okay. He just looked fantastic the way that he was intercepting, floating across packs. He was doing absolutely everything that we need to see. And another great thing about this is 80% disposal efficiency. So if you really need to get someone in your forward line, you can go for Charlie. His, whatever he scores next week, he will be definitely going up a fair bit the week after. He could absolutely fall off his chair and still go up a good 50k with that score in his system. So I'm all for getting him, particularly next week. But if you need to go early, I think that you can go there. And it's the same with Sam Darcy. If you really need to get a player in your forward line, you don't want to go early on Charlie. You've seen enough from Darcy to be confident on him. You're not too worried about Bevo or Lob coming back. There's still a heap of coins to make here. So future DPP upcoming with him as well. And that's something I should have mentioned with Charlie Combin, a forward defensive DPP coming up after round six. That'd be guaranteed if he plays the next couple. So yes, on Combin, if he needs to go early, but I would rather wait. It is a big risk still. And yes, on Sam Darcy, if you missed him last week. Lafayette is going to be an extremely slow burn. We can see a three-rounder of 38. If he scores 32, another 20k to make, but would not be looking to go there. Kyle Lohman had a lot of questions about him during the week, so I did decide to put out a quick player profile. Goes for about 13 minutes. I'll give you all the data, all the numbers that you need to make your own decision there, but for me personally, a pass for now. Charlie Lazaro, you don't want to see the omission symbol in the notes if you own a particular player in the stocky, and unfortunately he does have that symbol there. Didn't play last week, also has the sub symbol. He was subbed out, I believe in his last game or the game before that. So awkward stages for those people that own Lazaro. He's still got a negative break even, so if he comes back into the side, more coins to make. But it's a decision you're gonna to have to make. Harvey Thomas, well, we saw him get 100 the week before his last game, but yeah, don't things change in just a week? Sub there, but as an owner, you definitely hold on to him. Buku Kamis, future DPP, as you can see. What a talented player he is. Now, we've had the Rob symbol on a couple of other blokes in the stocky so far. There's a few people that think that he was robbed as well. So, 67 for a three-rounder, a negative six break-even. What a pod rookie he has been, and he'll get defensive status to match up with that forward status as well. So handy stuff there. Alex Sexton, not so sexy anymore, is he? Similar to the Lazaro note section, we do have the omission there. With some of these young blokes coming into the side, I just don't see him coming back anytime soon. So although he's getting future DPP, and he's someone that you could flip with that Karmas, with that defensive forward status. I think he's going to be a bit of a dead pick for now. He'll have to rely on either some super VFL form or else some injuries to other players currently in the 22 to regain his spot. So I'm more than happy if you decide to move on Sexton now. Now, there's not a lot to see in the buy column here. We've got Cadman at the top with a minus three break even. Without a doubt, we need to hold that. Chris Burgess, super disappointing for owners last week with a 15 subbed out of the game. Now, he's guaranteed to be a slow burn for the short term anyway. Caleb Windsor, I think there's money to be made here and then possibly look to flip on his buy next week. That's probably going to be the play for those that still own him at the moment. My man, Noah Answorth at the Lions, tough as nails this bloke. A decent runner as well, but I think with the role that he has at the price, it's over 200 k I'm passing for now. Darcy Wilson, now, I'm not going to rant because I do want to rapidly get through this, but if you are interested in my rants or hearing my rants about Darcy Wilson, listen to the Swordplay podcast from this week because champion data absolutely robbed this bloke. A tackle, free kick four, two minutes to go in his defensive 50, long kick down the line, effective disposal, well, we'll only give you three points for that. Absolutely robbed, but that's a discussion for another day. Or even we've had that discussion already. Sethi Campbell, 229,800. He's made some coin there. Still looking to make over 10K this week with a very modest score of a 31. I think the play as well as maybe with a Windsor could be to look to flip him on the buy. And Tommy Berry, I did flag this for people that were looking to bring him in. I thought that 100 was very much a once-off. We've seen that over the last couple of weeks. Has not performed anywhere near to that level, let's be honest. So if he scores a 45 this week, he's going to lose 10K. So with a break-even in the red of 67, time to go, Tommy. Thanks for your services, mate. 
So that's it for now, guys. Apologies for the lack of detail and game-by-game -game notes this week. It's been a real mission getting this one out, but hopefully I'll get it out before lunchtime. If you're working, hopefully you can sit back with your sang or your pie, whatever you're getting into yourself. Maybe a nice, healthy salad and uh, have a look at the stocky. But that is it for now, guys. Time to get rid of something to eat. Time to have a bit of a rest myself, and I'll see you soon in the next one. Cheers, bye. Can you say bye to everyone? <laughs>